Good afternoon to you all and welcome. Um, my name's Matthew Harding. Uh, I'm the Dean of the Law School. And a very warm welcome to each one of you, uh, whether you're here with us or I gather there are some participants on Zoom. Um, hello to you too. Uh, on this International Women's Day uh, 2023. This, of course, is a day of global celebration uh, to honour the activism and the struggles of women all over the world who've contested and continue to contest how law, politics and institutions reduce women and gender diverse people to the status of secondary subjects. It's a day to reflect on and to celebrate current struggles for justice and equity and to publicly discuss how these struggles are intersectional, intergenerational, international and collaborative. Uh, as Dean, and before I introduce our distinguished speaker, can I begin by acknowledging country. We're meeting today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. This is a place of their law. This is a place that's been taken care of by their honoured custodians past and present for thousands of years. Uh, I pay my respect to their leadership in caring for this land through their law. And I also acknowledge all the Indigenous nations of our country and their elders past, present and emerging. A particularly warm welcome to all First Nations people who join us today. And of course on this day, uh, may I pay my respects to the senior women of all Indigenous nations here and abroad for the enduring leadership that they demonstrate day after day, caring for their land through law, caring for their people, for their children, for their communities. Uh, and uh, through their courage and their strength. Uh, now to our distinguished speaker. Uh, Professor Jenny Hocking, AM, um, is of course an award-winning uh, and prolific author, uh, an emeritus professor at Monash University, a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, uh, the inaugural Distinguished Whitlam Fellow at the Whitlam Institute at Western Sydney University, biographer of Whitlam. Uh, the two-volume biography of, of Whitlam was shortlisted for several major literary awards, including the Prime Minister's Literary Award, the Age Book of the Year, the National Biography Award, and was winner of the Fellowship of Australian Writers Barbara Ramsden Award. Professor Hocking may be known to you in recent years as the scholar who commenced legal action against the National Archives of Australia uh, seeking public access to the secret palace letters between the late Queen Elizabeth II and the Governor-General of Australia, Sir John Kerr, letters relating to Kerr's 1975 dismissal of the Whitlam government, uh, of particular interest to the lawyers in the room. In 2020, in a six-to-one decision, the High Court of Australia found in Professor Hocking's favour, uh, ending the Queen's indefinite embargo of the letters and paving the way for their release. Uh, Professor Hocking's latest book, The Palace Letters, The Queen, The Governor-General and The Plot to Dismiss Gough Whitlam, who cannot be drawn to a book with such a title, <laughs> <laughs> tells the story of this remarkable archival research journey and legal battle uh, to secure the release of the public letters and their impact on the history of the dismissal of the Whitlam government. That book was awarded uh, a special commendation in the 2020 Henry Mayer Award for Best Book on Australian Politics and a commendation in the Manda Jones Awards. There are, of course, many achievements to celebrate in Professor Hocking's career. There are also aspects of her story that may not be as well known uh, to you and we're delighted that she's agreed to join us today to speak with us about one such aspect of her journey the contributions and the influence of her mother, Barbara. Barbara Hocking's jurisprudential thinking about the common law and native title in the early 1970s was groundbreaking. She was the first barrister briefed in the Mabo case. You'll note the image of the uh, plaintiffs and the counsel in Mabo, uh, and you'll note the absence, of course, of Jenny's mother in that image, but she was the first barrister briefed in that case. 
and is perhaps the most important non-Indigenous lawyer and scholar in the quest for land justice in this country that you may not know about. We're absolutely delighted that we have the opportunity today on International Women's Day to reflect on Barbara's uh, often overlooked legacy. Um, before I uh, invite Professor Hocking to come to the podium, um, please note that um, during the course of the presentation there will be references and images of uh, deceased persons um, and uh, that's uh, something that uh, is important to know about before uh, the presentation begins. Uh, after Professor Hocking uh, speaks, my colleague, Associate Professor Anne Genovese, uh, sorry, Professor Anne Genovese, <laughs> Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion, let me get the order of that right, <laughs> uh, will facilitate um, a, a Q&A and give the vote of thanks. Uh, it was Anne, along with Dr Eddie Cubillo, our Associate Dean Indigenous, who invited Professor Hocking today. Um, Dr Cubillo is unable to be with us, unfortunately, sends his apologies. And so, uh, Professor Hocking, uh, I'll hand over to you, and we very much look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. I begin by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I pay my respects also to the elders of all nations who are here with us today. Thank you, Professor Harding, for such a very warm welcome. And thank you to the Melbourne Law School, and in particular to Professor Anne Genovese, Associate Dean Diversity and Inclusion, and Dr Eddie Kubelo, Associate Dean Indigenous Programs and Director of the Indigenous Law and Justice Hub, for inviting me here. And thank you all for coming. And thank you indeed for giving me this opportunity to speak about my mother, to reflect on her extraordinarily significant work. And I've learned such a lot doing this today. It's been really interesting. But also her, her influence on this nation through the legal action, the Mabo case, in which she played a pivotal role. And her absence from this photo is something we can now redress. <laughs> it's a very great honour to do so both as a historian and as her daughter. It's a particular honour to speak today on International Women's Day. I couldn't think of a more fitting person to speak about. It's the day we celebrate and recall the achievements of women around the world and acknowledge and seek to address the difficulties and discriminations that persist in access to education, reproductive rights, safety, basic equality and opportunity. In 1981, my mother, Barbara Hocking, commenced work as the first barrister briefed by Eddie Koiki Mabo and Father Dave Passy, the original plaintiffs in the case that would lead a decade later to the High Court of Australia and one of the most important judgments in this nation's history in Mabo and Queensland number two. My mother's work on the Mabo case grew out of a decade of legal argument she had developed on the recognition of native title in common law. From her 1970 Master of Law thesis at Monash, called Native Land Rights, her 1974 Master of Arts qualifying thesis, also at Monash, which was called Aboriginal Land Rights, an Australian Injust Injustice, her 1988 book International Law and Aboriginal Human Rights, we have a, an image of the cover of that book, together with mine. Um, many articles, many, many articles, including what is a very robust, rigorous legal shakedown of the Milurpum or Gove case, which was in the Federal Law Review in 1979. It's a really, really um, terrific article to read, knowing that two years later the Mabo case is taking shape. And that was called, Do Does Aboriginal Law Now Run in Australia? And that's just a handful of what are many, many speeches, publications, book chapters and so on over several decades. But without a doubt, the most important of these public contributions was the paper my mother delivered at the famous 1981 Townsville Conference, which I'm sure you've all heard of, on land rights and the future of Australian race relations. It was co-chaired by Eddie Koiki Mabo and historian Noel Luz, 
and organised by the Townsville Treaty Committee and the James Cook University Student Union. So it brought together the people who became the plaintiffs, historians Henry Reynolds and Noel Lewes, La Trobe University anthropologists Dr Noni Sharp, Dr H.C. Nugget Coombs and lawyers Greg McIntyre and Barbara Hocking. And in bringing that sort of confluence of people together who all became central to the case, the conference was a defining moment in the struggle for legal recognition of native title. In his paper, Land Rights for Torres Strait Islanders, Eddie Koiki Mabo set out the system of ownership and inheritance still existing on Mur. There were physical markers of boundaries and the recognition of a means of setting, settling disputes according to Marlow law, which had for many decades been reflected in the Queensland Murray Island court reports. And these reports would later form a large part, a very large part of the voluminous statement of facts, which were lodged in the High Court in December 1983, and which, with my mother's laborious handwritten amendments, are among her papers. My mother's paper to the conference was called Is Might Right? An argument for the recognition of traditional Aboriginal title to land in the Australian courts. And as you can tell from that title, she essentially set out the legal framework for an action which could and should be taken to recognise traditional Aboriginal title to their lands. In her view, the correct legal position, which was not yet established in Australia, was that, as she said, when the British Crown acquires sovereignty over a territory, pre-existing property rights are preserved and a clear expression of intention to the contrary is necessary to extinguish them. And that had not been done. Barbara went on to argue that a test case should be brought by a group of Queensland Aboriginals who still live on their tribal lands. And she made that very clear. The plaintiffs had to be chosen extremely carefully and the pleadings had to be got right, as she said. And that would determine whether they had a just and legal claim to their lands and thereby overturn the specious notion of terra nullius, which was still embedded in Australian law. Interestingly, even if this case were not successful, she told the conference, it would serve as a catalyst for political action. She said it could influence the attitudes of white Australians. It might, for example, lead to the establishment of a court of claims or an Aboriginal claims commission and a treaty or Makarata. Now, in preparation for this, I've spent the last week doing something I'd put off doing for a decade <laughs> since my mother died, and that was go through her papers. <laughs> so there's been a box on the floor of my study with Marbo written on it <laughs> for the last 10 years. She died 10 years ago this year. Quite emotional, so you'll have to forgive me if I do get a bit emotional at times. But I was so thrilled to find there three cassettes of the Townsville Conference. <laughs> and so for the first time, I have listened to my mother presenting at the conference. This was quite, quite thrilling. But I'd previously only read this paper. I had read it um, uh, in quite some detail because it's published in, I think it's Oberoi, who published several of the, all of the papers that were presented there. And what immediately struck me, and this is the historian coming out, I think, is the key differences between the paper as delivered and the paper as spoken. And she actually addresses that in the beginning in her introductory remarks. She explains why she's not reading out what is a very, very complex, full of incredible, extraordinary international case law um, throughout and why, you know, in that half an hour or so she has, she's going to speak to it. And it's why I think it's so important, certainly in the work I do, to look at a whole range of sources and often several versions of a single source if it's important. Because it's in those sort of interstices between the two versions, I think, lie some critical formative elements of the Marbo case itself. And perhaps we can just, um, in a moment, I'll go to a, a short clip of her speaking. But what I found is it's only by listening to her speaking that it becomes really clear beyond any question that Barbara's presentation was quite literally setting out this legal framework because this is what she had been asked to do when she was invited to the conference. Her presentation then directly addresses 
future plaintiffs who may be listening with phrases like, you need to establish that, you have to convince the courts that. And that's an aspect that may not immediately come across in what is a formal written paper addressing the legal aspects. Barbara had been invited to speak on those prospects by Dr Coombs and she felt the magnitude of this keenly. And this is very typical of her. She describes it in her opening marks as this is a terrifying responsibility. And that's because of the failures of Milerpum and more recently the co-cases which she said had been badly presented. Her participation therefore was very much that of a barrister providing an opinion on the prospects and pitfalls of taking a case to the High Court, the existing Australian and international cases in support and the errors in the law to be avoided, evidenced by what she firmly believed was Blackburn Jay's, quote, backward and legally incorrect ruling in Gove. If we could just have a listen to very briefly a couple of clips of her speaking. She's speaking of what is in her printed paper. At the top of page four of this article, I've asked what is not a rhetorical question, I've asked a very serious legal question. And are we a nation of thieves? In this area, as you all know, there's only been one case in Australia, and that was Millerton's case. It, as I point out in the paper, was not properly presented and is, in most of its aspects, I think, would not be regarded as binding by the High Court at all. So that I think, on the comments in Coe's case, that the High Court is almost hopeful that you will take a case to it and ask it, to make a finding on the position. Yeah, I, th I find that a really interesting clip because what she says about Co is absolutely right. I had a quick look at that judgment uh, just the other day and certainly Murphy and Gibbs do seem to be saying very clearly we want a case, but we want a better case. <laughs> um, and she's very acutely aware of this. Um, as she ended her speech, my mother made her own views very, very clear. She simply said, I hope you succeed. When the conference ended, Eddie Marbo and Father Dave Passy briefed Barbara and Greg McIntyre, who would be the solicitor throughout the case, to commence work on their historic claim in the High Court for native title over their traditional lands. Ron Caston QC was brought in as senior barrister and was subsequently joined by Brian Keon Cohen as a junior. Although the Townsville conference is widely seen as the formal beginning of the Marbo case, the conceptual development for my mother had begun a decade earlier. Noni Sharp writes that for nearly 10 years before the conference, Barbara had raised the issue of whether prior titles did exist in Australia despite official denial. The renowned Canadian legal and political theorist, Professor Peter Russell, has similarly very recently reflected on the centrality of her work, describing Barbara as very much the intellectual architect of the Mabo case. I want to take you now to the beginning of that intellectual architecture, which I think is a wonderful term. And it's to 1947 in this university and in this very faculty, when my mother began an arts law degree. 15 years and four children later, she graduated <laughs> in 1962. And I must say thank you to your wonderful Melbourne University Archive student records for getting me her student record in very short time. <laughs> because <clears throat> what I realise now is that like so many of the few women studying law at the time, she dropped it all once she got married. What I didn't know till I saw her student record is that she returned to finish her law degree in 1956 when I was just two years old. <laughs> And she did her final year in 1961. That is five years and two children more. <laughs> so with four children under the age of 10, she did that last year. And she received her best marks in her law degree in those last two years in constitutional law and in jurisprudence. It's quite remarkable. 
Now, if it was unusual for a woman to be studying law in the 1940s, and I believe it was, it was even more unusual for a woman with four young children to be finishing it more than 10 years later. And I wonder now, having been a working mother myself with a host of supportive family, including my mother, around me, which she did not have by any stretch, how on earth she managed this load, which always and without question included the usual domestic activities, shopping, cleaning, cooking every night for four unruly children and with a husband who worked very long hours and seemed himself to be always at the point of exhaustion. I just had no conception then of the pressure she must have been under and I do marvel now at her determination that she was going to somehow do it all. At home, to make a personal reflection, <laughs> We were noisy, boisterous. In fact, I think we were pretty wild. My aunt called us unguided missiles. <laughs> and, you know, when I think about it, it was a very strange mixture of uncontrolled parenting. I think this was Dr Spock, Dr Spock's influence, um, and bizarre cultural restrictions. We weren't allowed to watch television. Um, we never had a television when I was young. Or drink Coca-Cola or eat butter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about why, or to read Enid, Enid Blyton. And that was years before Enid Blyton was cancelled. So, you know, I think my mother was very ahead of her time in lots of ways. Now, as, as we got older, we did get a television, but I was, you know, I never really got into television, I suppose, for that reason. I should be grateful I read books. But all American television was forbidden, and she would say it was cultural American junk food. And that was a term she even used with her grandchildren. And they'll often say, oh, that's cultural American junk food. <laughs> Except for Perry Mason, because that was about a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and she loved animals. You know, this is a very romanticised view of my childhood, I'm sure. But I do remember. We just had endless animals, not necessarily all at the same time. But we had cats, kittens, chickens, guinea, p guinea pigs, rabbits, and always at least two dogs. She was strong-minded, fiercely loyal, politically engaged and a long-time Labor Party member, which became a bit of a problem when they moved to Turak when I was in my teens because there was no Labor Party. And she would go to the Taronga branch and there's a lovely story when she was very unwell and dying about the Taronga Party branch, but I probably won't be able to repeat it to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, they were very beautiful. Uh, and she was a fearsome arguer over the dinner table. And... I grew up with these, you know, what to me were very normal uh, debates and arguments, and I really enjoyed them. And I only realised years later that other, fa other people found it slightly terrifying. <laughs> and I'd go to my cousins or my friends' houses for, you know, maybe a sleepover or something, and I was always shocked how quiet it was. <laughs> Our house just seemed to have this sort of edge of chaos. There was also an eclecticism in my mother, her love of gardening, architecture, detective stories and travel. She had a creativity and an intellectual curiosity, I think, which led her to question what others saw as settled law. And if she disagreed with it, she worked to overcome it. She said the common law had been mistakenly interpreted in Australia, despite the whole of the continent being inhabited since time immemorial by Indigenous owners it had been held as a matter of law to be a terra nullius, that is to say, a deserted land belonging to no one. The legal result was that the Indigenous Australians had been a populous nullus, the people who were not here. It was actually during her final year at Melbourne University that Barbara first studied issues relating to native title. She remembered decades later that one of their recommended legal texts was The Legal Conscience, by Felix Cohen, who you know, is, is really well known for his work on Native American native title, as she described it. Cohen's influence was significant in terms of both its exposition of native title and also the import it gave to what the Columbia Law Review called the moral question of whether the law is what it ought to be. And that moral dimension I think, resonates through much of my mother's work. What we just heard before, where she said, are we a nation of thieves? That's a moral question, but as she says, it's not just a rhetorical question. It is a very serious legal question because to her, these two things went together. The law properly applied would answer moral issues 
in the appropriate way. She had extraordinary confidence in the law, I must say. Um, setting the law to rights, then, I think was another example of that and of that nexus that she saw between uh, moral questions and judicial ones. In, nine, in 2006, so this is 40 years later, Barbara recalled in an interview, a lot of the work that Felix Cohen did was for the recognition of Native American land. And I thought, why don't we have this here? She said this was in the 1960s and hardly anyone in the white community had heard of it in Australia. So she recognised here was a, a gap, the classic, you know, lacuna you might get your PhD students to do some work on. And so she set out to address that herself, that legal and theoretical neglect in the area of study she then pursued, and what, which became what she always described as my life's work. Somehow, amid our domestic chaos, in 1967 she began a Master of Law at Monash on the legal recognition in Australia of traditional native title at common law. It's important to remember that this was a highly controversial area of study here and the perspective my mother brought to it was at best contested, if not simply dismissed. The Gove case, Millerpum and Kamalco, was still working its way through the federal court and Blackburn J reached his decision rejecting native title and finding that the doctrine of terra nullius prevailed in 1971 the year my mother was awarded a Master of Law for her thesis arguing that it did not. What's even more remarkable is that she had pursued this thesis against the advice of her supervisor. And I do recall this being a real issue when it came to submission. Um, her supervisor was an esteemed senior academic who simply could not accept her central premise. So Barbara was presenting what was then a legally unsupported argument in Australia for the recognition at common law of a form of native title ownership, as it had been in other settler jurisdictions. In Professor Peter Russell's words, and funnily enough, my sister Barbara Senior, who I think is watching, um, uh, and I are both still in touch with Professor Russell. She was the first Australian scholar to explore this legal terrain. My mother showed great determination and self-belief, first in finishing her degree and then in completing her thesis. Above all, as I said, it shows the strength of her belief in the law itself, if correctly applied, to right the legal wrong of terra nullius, and as she so often said, to set the law to rights. And yet, as I think we've heard from Professor Harding in all the thousands of words written about that remarkable judgment and its transformation of the very essence of colonial settlement and sovereignty, my mother's critical scholarship and her role in the Mabo case itself is frequently overlooked. One widely used and official website detailing the case describes her involvement in this way. A lawyer in the audience suggested there should be a test case to claim land rights through the court system and then omits her altogether from the erroneous list of legal counsel that follows. And this is by no means an isolated example. This scholarly occlusion was only cemented by what I call the cultural construction of the Marbo case. There have been four films about the case, three of which make no mention of her at all. And this is despite one of those filmmakers, whom I better not name, but whom I knew well, <laughs> um, interviewing my mother at length and using some of her original material before completely omitting her from the finished film. You know, in one way, there's a very interesting analysis to do that I'm sure many of us are very, very familiar with about how and why women become dropped off in the history. But interestingly, and in my view, not at all coincidentally, only the dramatic film Marbo by the Indigenous filmmaker Rachel Perkins includes Barbara as part of the original legal team. And it was a really lovely moment. This was only the year, I think, before my mother died for my sisters and I to be with her watching this film and how delighted she was that she was portrayed on the screen and how we all just fell about in hysterical laughter when there was a scene of my mother with a pot of tea. <laughs> <laughs> and this is because, as everybody who knows her and certainly her family would tell you, my mother loved tea. <laughs> and a steaming pot of tea accompanied her everywhere, even in the law school library 
where my sister was still studying at Monash at the same time, and she'd say, oh, I saw Mum with a pot of tea. <laughs> <laughs> and always in the car. The teapot would sit on the floor of the uh, left-hand passenger <laughs> side. And so um, when we were very young, we'd all race to the car to try desperately to get in the back seat of the car. <laughs> because if you were the unfortunate remaining person who had to sit in the front, you'd have your feet scalded every time Mum went round the corner. <laughs> oh, I've got this wonderful image, which I must show you. As you can see, this is a wonderful photo. I just love this. I think actually Brian, yes, Brian Keon kind of this. But this is of my mother on the fact-finding visit to Murr, the island of Murr in 1982. And it's her with Auntie Flo Kennedy, um, but they also collected evidence, of course, with Eddie Koike Mabo and the legal team um, preparing the pleadings for the first Mabo case. But she became known for taking her tea everywhere. Um, and I think it was um, Greg McIntyre told me that he wished he'd had his camera when they were all in one of the boats on near close to shore <laughs> and the boat capsized and Barbara emerged holding her pot of tea. <laughs> um, but this, this was a wonderful time for her and I think you can get a sense of how relaxed and close this group is. Um, and she certainly considered this visit to Mer, meeting the Merriam people, the plaintiffs, their families, as one of the highlights of her work on the case. And it's certainly one of the few instances I can recall her telling me about um, you know, with great affection. And in 1982, May 1982, the writ and the statement of claim initiating the case were issued in the Brisbane Registry of the High Court on behalf of what were now five plaintiffs. Eddie Koki Mabo, Father Dave Passy, Sam Passy, James Rice and Celia Mapo Saley on their own behalf and on behalf of the members of their respective family groups. Uh, and this is the statement of claim. I remember quite vividly when my mother read these powerful opening words of the statement of claim to me. We were staying with our family on holiday. We had a house full of children, and by then we were young adults, and friends, and numerous animals, of course. When my mother appeared and read me, these very evocative words, since time immemorial, the Torres Strait Islands of the Mur, known as Murray, Danar and Waiur, and their surrounding seas, seabeds, fringing reefs and adjacent islets have been continuously inhabited by people called the Merriam people. For the next eight years, the Marbo case was the central goal of her legal work and the highest priority in her practice at the bar. I was just beginning my PhD studies at Sydney University and so I knew very little about her work at this time. When I first saw, you know, the big legal arch folders in her chambers with the letters M-A-B-O down the spine, I simply had no sense either of what it was or what its significance would be and was at that time. In 1986, Barbara appeared as junior to Ron Caston QC in the remitter case at Queensland Supreme Court before Justice Moynihan, and in 1988 in the High Court in Mabo No. 1. This was the demurrer case against the Queensland National Country Party government of Joe Bielke peterson disgraceful attempt, while the Mabo case was in train, to retrospectively abolish their native title rights through the Queensland Coast Islands Declaratory Act. Bielke petersons crude attempt failed when the Act was found by a slim majority, 4-3, to be in breach of the Whitlam government's Racial Discrimination Act 1975 and ruled in Vallon. And the substantive case, of course, was then able to continue to the High Court as Mabo No. 2. So without the Racial Discrimination Act, I don't think it's too much to say that there would have been no Mabo case, certainly not to its full conclusion as we know it. In the four years between Mabo's No. 1 and 2, my mother retired from the bar. She was appointed a senior member of the Commonwealth Veterans Review Tribunal and chairperson of the Medicare Participation Review Committee. She continued to write and speak about the legal recognition of native title and the Marbo case as it progressed. The High Court's decision in Marbo was handed down in 1992, recognising native title in common law and overturning the legal fiction of terror nullius. She was absolutely elated. She said, I gained a great deal of satisfaction from the state, from the case. 
not only was it very rewarding to be involved in setting something right that was wrong in the law, but it was also wrong ethically. Again, you see that infusion of moral questions with legal ones coming together. She told ABC Radio, after Mabo, it became part of the common law of Australia that in 1788, the Indigenous Aboriginal inhabitants were both a legal and a factual reality. They had inhabited the continent and developed a traditional system of property law known in the common law as native title. The Mabo case was the end of the legal fiction of terra nullius and the beginning of the political struggle to turn the High Court's landmark decision into action. My mother never stopped working to achieve that. Shortly before she died, she wrote, I think this is actually what she said in an interview, the Mabo decision achieved a balance on the scales of legal justice of which we can all, especially those of us who care about the rule of law, be extremely proud. Political justice, then, is the next step when a reconciliation compensation commission is set up and the change of sovereignty is embodied in a formal treaty agreement. In 1992, Barbara was awarded the Australian Human Rights Medal uh, for her contribution to the Mabo case and work over many years to gain legal recognition for Indigenous peoples' rights. The five plaintiffs, Eddie Koiki, Mabo and Sam... Uh, Passy, Father Dave Passy, James Rice and Celia Marpo Sally were also awarded the Human Rights Medal that year in recognition of their long and determined battle to gain justice for their people. And this was again a high point in that public recognition. She was immensely proud of that. Her work as a, my work as an academic and a writer was beginning just as my mother's was ending. Her influence on me and my work has been absolute. I recognise it in the interdisciplinarity of my own research, which sits at the intersection of politics, history and law. And that reflects, I think, in its own sphere, her, her conceptual breadth and her scholarship as both theory and practice. Her influence grew even stronger when I turned to writing political biography, which was not what I was initially doing. Because that's an unusually creative form of non-fiction, which once I discovered it as a writer, as opposed to a reader, I absolutely loved writing in. And so the sort of dry political theory I'd been working on before didn't really get a look in after that. I, I knew the form I really enjoyed exploring and that let you bring an interdisciplinarity into academic study. And as you might perhaps expect, my first biography was of a major political and legal figure. The great reforming Attorney General in the Whitlam government and later High Court Justice Lionel Murphy QC. Biography, certainly in my hands, brings together politics, law and history, and at least as I approach it, has a strong sense of family as a critical defining feature. D.H. Lawrence captured the undeniable influence of family when he wrote, the ideas of one generation become the instincts of the next. And as I speak today about the influence of my mother on me and my work, how could I believe anything else? But how could we understand, for example, Gough Whitlam's belief in education and universal health as the great drivers of equal opportunity or his commitment to the institutions of democracy if we didn't know first of his father, the great Solicitor General Fred Whitlam's work both in Australia and as Australia's representative on human rights at the UN and if we didn't know of the adolescent criminality of Gough's grandfather? who spent four years from the age of 19 in Pentridge, much to Gough's shock, and who turned to Baptist religious redemption on his release from prison. This is one of the many great secrets revealed in my first volume of my <laughs> biography, <laughs> Gough Whitlam, A Moment in History. And just as an aside, when I took Gough Whitlam straight off the press, the first copy of this book, being very excited about it, uh, and he hadn't, of course, seen it before, he looks at the title, A Moment in History, for just a second, and then he looked at me and said, A Moment in History? It should be an era in history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have to say he was utterly shocked to hear of his grandfather, as was I. But having written three biographies, I've also written about Murphy and about the Australian author Frank Hardy. <laughs> 
uh, in which family was always very much present. I could hardly fail to re recognise those same family influences in my own work in pursuing the full story of the dismissal of the Whitlam government, even though it did not accord with what was then the established history of it. And my mother's influence was never more apparent to me than in 2016 when I began a legal action in the federal court. By this time she had, of course, died against the National Archives of Australia over its refusal to release the Queen's secret correspondence with the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, about Kerr's dismissal of the Whitlam government. Now, Kerr's papers had been in the National Archives for many years, but they'd only been open to the public in 2005, and I'd made extensive use of them in the first volume of the biography, which came out, I think, in 2008. So I'd really been the first person to work through these. And it was where I'd found the extraordinary revelation of the role of Sir Anthony Mason. They secretly meeting with Kerr, that they discussed the moves towards dismissal together over many, many months. Kerr had left a 12-page document detailing every one of those meetings, which Mason has since acknowledged. Mason even wrote a letter of dismissal for Kerr, and he was a sitting High Court Justice at the time. It was a truly shocking revelation. But there was one part of that which we could not see and I was denied access to for a decade and that was Kerr's correspondence with the Queen. It was embargoed by the Queen in England even though they were held in Canberra. So on one level it was slightly ridiculous. but On another level as a historian it was extremely disturbing because this was effectively a royal censorship of history. If you're interested in this area the Index on Censorship, the UK publication, has just had a special issue on what they're calling Royal Censorship of History, and it includes this case as one example of how difficult it is to get access to these materials. Anyway, I believed it was all based on a very incorrect, totally incorrect application of the Archives Act, but taking a federal court action to get them released was never on my radar. I mean, the prohibitive expense of that ruled it out immediately. And that all changed when I read an article by the Sydney barrister Tom Brennan called Australia Owns Its Own History. Because Brennan was arguing legally, as I did politically, that the palace letters should be released and that we didn't need the Queen's permission to access our own documents according to our Archives Act, if it was correctly applied. So it was only after I met Tom Brennan, which I then did, that the possibility of a legal challenge, which he was absolutely certain about, then arose. And of course, here you see what is really quite a wonderful familial circularity, because Tom Brennan is the son of Gerard Brennan, the Chief Justice in, who made the magnificent ruling and judgment in the Mabo case. So there's just this marvellous sort of linking coming together across generations that that is really quite wonderful. And I do want to express my thanks uh, to the generosity and public spiritedness of that legal team, which was so marvellous, Tom, of course. And in another familial uh, circularity, uh, our main lead barrister, Anthony Whitlam, KC, <laughs> son of, uh, and um, a, a wonderful legal team, including Brett Walker, at the appeal and at the High Court. The archives strenuously contested the case, claiming the letters were personal and not subject to the Archives Act. Now, you know, the idea that um, letters at the apex, between people at the apex of a constitutional monarchy, Queen on the one hand and the Governor-General on the other, could be personal was just ridiculous, particularly when they're discussing the possible dismissal of an elected government. As Brett Walker, SC, told the court, it's not as if the Governor-General was telling her about a good novel he'd just read. <laughs> <laughs> and I was even more astonished when the archives argued that a so-called convention of royal secrecy existed over and above the Archives Act. Who knew? You know, forget the terms of the Act. There's actually a thing called convention of royal secrecy, which meant that anything in its collection relating to the royal family had to be kept secret until the monarch tells us that we, the mere public, can actually view it. It's a deeply antithetical position for the archives to take, supporting the continued closure of some of its most important records. Its core function is to collect and facilitate access to our history, our historical documents. And yet it was claiming a broad provision of secrecy covered all its royal documents. 
I also faced a formidable barrier in taking this case. The archives were supported by submissions from Buckingham Palace and from Government House, and when it got to the High Court, the Morrison Government, through the Solicitor General, Christian Porter, joined it in a joint submission against their release. It took four years from the initial federal court action, which I did not succeed, through a federal court appeal, which was lost on a rather devastating 2-1 decision, and finally to the High Court for the Palace Letters case to succeed. And walking into the High Court, I was lucky enough to be uh, for two days in one of the last live hearings before COVID hit in Canberra and the High Court was closed. And it was just a, a really extraordinary experience that I'm so immensely grateful for. Um, but I thought of my mother all the time. I, I, I remembered what she'd done with the Mabo case. I was very, very conscious of her presence at that time. And... In fact, that is how I persuaded Brett Walker to stand for a photo, um, because he was extremely reluctant to do so. Um, so that's a wonderful legal team, as you can imagine, Brett Walker and Tom Brennan uh, outside the court. So not only was the decision a 6-1 uh, emphatic ruling in our favour that the letters are not personal... Uh, and that they should be available under the provisions of the Archives Act. But the High Court also issued three cost orders against the archives. Um, and in the end, so that goes all the way back to the federal court action, costing it close to $2 million. Um, it was a terrible decision for the archives to make, and reputationally and otherwise it was very damaging to, the, to that. They were released in full in July 2020, and they have transformed uh, the history of the dismissal. They finally confirmed the long-suspected role of the Queen, um, who knew since September 1975, two months before the dismissal, that Kerr was considering dismissal, dismissing the government. They discussed with him the contentious reserve powers. The Queen's private secretary gave advice to Kerr on the use of those powers. And as former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has described, the letters are at times encouraging Kerr to dismiss the government. There's no doubt about that. All of this, of course, was secret from the government and, moreover, and critically, was directly contrary to the legal advice of the Australian Law Officers, the Solicitor General Sir Maurice Byers and the Attorney General, and, of course, against the advice of the Prime Minister, who retained the confidence of the House of Representatives at all times. My book, The Palace Letters, tells that story. It's been described as a courtroom drama, a political thriller <laughs> and riveting Australian history. I could not disagree. <laughs> Again and again during the four years of the court case as I wrote the book, I was acutely aware of my mother's profound influence and came to understand her better, her determination, her perseverance in the face of scepticism and disbelief above all else. And that's why the palace letters were so much connected to her. There was never any question I would dedicate that book to my mother, Barbara Hocking, the first barrister briefed in the Marbo case, who was there before me. And I'll end today with a story that brings us, um, <laughs> that's the release of the letters. Uh, <laughs> that's Matt Golding, I think, in The Guardian. I love that picture. Uh, but I want to end with a story that brings us full circle on these wonderful connections across and between the generations. And that's to describe a chance encounter I had with Jesse Marbo, Eddie Corky and Benita Marbo's daughter when our paths unexpectedly crossed of, at all places, the National <laughs> Archives of Australia. <laughs> because soon after the publication of the first volume of the Whitlam book, uh, uh, I was uh, a guest of the National Archives to give a talk about it because it draws so solidly on the archives themselves and it was a really terrific um, talk to give. But I was told as we were preparing for that that Jessie Marbo had rang them just that morning to let them know that she would be attending, which I was very excited about and thrilled at that prospect. So when we met afterwards and we talked for quite a while about our remarkable mothers, um, Jessie told me that she had actually been in a taxi on the way to the airport, having finished the work she'd come to Canberra to do and was on her way back to Brisbane, I think, when a friend rang her in the cab and told her that I was speaking at the archives. And she said she told the cab, stop, stop the cab, turn around. I want to meet Barbara Hocking's daughter. <laughs> not me, not Jenny Hocking. She wanted to meet Barbara Hocking's daughter. And in that moment, I felt I had been given just a glimpse of the role my mother had played 
in the Mabo family's exceptional and courageous struggle for recognition of their people and their land. And as we talked about that connection which had brought us together in the National Archives that day, remarkably enough, we realised it actually was Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it actually was. <laughs> and so we said, oh, quick, let's have our photo taken together to give to our mothers. <laughs> so, oh, there we are, thank you. So we took that photo, had that photo taken, and that was to give a copy to each of our mothers. So thank you very much for listening to me. I don't believe that. <laughs> I just want to open the floor um, to questions. We invited Jenny, Eddie and I, for lots of reasons that um, should be really obvious to you. Um, I have sat in this very classroom in a subject called public trials, which some people in this room have studied or um, participated in in lots of ways, and we study the Mabo decision and we use illegally, I now find out, but I have permission, the photo <laughs> that includes your mum. Oh. And we talk about the Townsville Conference and we do, and we also read you. We also read you and some of your work in relation to the Communist Party decision. Oh, right. And to like put um, the methodology of how people think of life in relation to law and what it means to persevere and what it means to inherit and what it means to kind of stand up are really important topics in that public trial subject. They're important topics for our students in doctrinal subjects we teach in this law school. There are some of my feminist jurisprudence students sitting here who we've just come from class today. This is exactly what we're talking about. How do you inherit a tradition? How do you make it your own? Um, and I just can't thank you enough. So oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Um, so if there are no other qu formal questions, um, we we'll, might um, put a close there. But thank you um, so much. And I would also note that we've had some... Oh, we've got a question. Yeah, we had some colleagues here from... Uh, Torres Strait Islander colleagues who were in the room as well who have um, taken the time to come listen to you today. Oh, so that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just sort of thinking about bubble. It's like it's just uh, probably the absence of questions because it's just stunning. Your talk is so fascinating about the role of the mother, the influence of women in the law, the fact that the women are being overlooked even now. Um, so I suppose... Um, I'm interested in like the future of the law and current um, – I'm, I'm in practice, I'm not an academic – but current academic thinking that the area of land law um, is really driving fundamental change to the law itself. And so issues around sovereignty and the voice and land law, land law itself are undergoing like absolutely transformative rethinks. Um, so, I don't know. Do, <laughs> have you got any thoughts about that? And on International Women's Day, the role of women. I mean, I'm a professional person. How do I leave a legacy that's valuable and so on? So, anyway. Well, I think everyone does leave a legacy um, in different ways. And, you know, sometimes there are legacies waiting to be uncovered, if you like, that history forgets. And that's what's always fascinated me in working in that sort of nexus between history, law and politics, is I've always liked going back, like the Communist Party dissolution case, to something that brings it all together, but also that starts to sort of rattle around what you think is a settled history, but actually deep down you think, that's not right, there's more to that. And, you know, that's the way we change history as well. And, but you have to go back to the original documents. And some, that may include, you know, oral history, et cetera, which, you know, the Barbo case itself allowed for the use of types of history that I know previously they might not have looked at. But, you know, in the area I'm looking at now, which is very different again, it does go back to colonial times. But one of the things that has struck me again about particular women that I know were significant at the time of... Um, of, say, businesses getting off the ground in the, you know, I'm talking really early in 1790, 18, 10, that sort of thing. Those women are there in prominent positions 
They're in the Gazette. They're in some of the great petitions that are being sent back to the UK about convict rights. 10, 20, 30 years later, they disappear from the history books. So it, it is a process of, of always questioning how history is representing uh, facts at any one time and going back to what Whitlam gave a wonderful paper right here, I think, to public history students, graduate students, shortly before, maybe 10 years before he died. And he said, go to the documents. The talk was called, go to the documents. And he said, you have to go back to the original documents. Don't go to what journalists are telling you the story is, particularly about his government. Don't even go to half the stuff that was written about in the next 20 years, because every archival search releases new material. Who knew about Mason? Who denied any role whatsoever until we found it? Um, you know, it's, it's extraordinary how, and quite worrying, how people in public office actually did not tell the truth about their role in that. So, you know, I, su I suppose I'm saying I think it's a good thing that history changes. I think it's, of course, a good thing that the law changes. One of the interesting comments um, that I read about the Marbo case was that the law had finally caught up to the history. Mm. Um, and there are often cases where the history has to catch up with the law, I can assure you. So we just keep it working away in our own areas and, um, and hope that happens. But it is happening, it is. When I think of the difference in the universities between when I began, had not been a woman, a tenured woman, in the politics department in either of the major Melbourne universities, Monash and Melbourne, at the time I was first applying for positions there. I mean, it's extraordinary. But in that time, which is probably 30 years ago, the, the, the transformation has been absolutely complete. So I have hope. <laughs> Um, Jenny. Was there another question oh, here, no. I think? Yes. I was just wondering, you've written about some remarkable people, and did you work on a project at the moment, and also how do you choose who to be the right person? They're wonderful questions. I am working at the moment on a much-neglected case that, not a case, a person, a family, that, you know, got pushed back because of an unexpected legal action, and then another book. It's a wonderful book. Highly recommend it. Um, so this is, this is the case about the colonial family that I mentioned. I'm actually looking at three generations of them. They're not well known, although interestingly, a couple of history articles I found, one or two that do say this family sits at the margins of history. One of them said, I thought it was a great phrase, because they are. They're there at all these key historical moments. They have fascinating, interesting, at times fatal relationships with Indigenous people. Uh, they're a way of telling our history right up to pre-Federation. And it ends with Australian rules football. So, you know, mm -hmm. how much better could you get than that? So it's, it's a wonderful generational story. Um, and that's what has always interested me in biographies, family, as we talked about today. Um, in, you know, the impact on later generations in terms of their thinking, their ethical frameworks and so on. Um, and also, I'm really struck by the way the first person who is the, the woman who comes out, she's a free woman, chooses to come out with a convict husband. No one did that on the same convict boat. About six women ever did that. She is a really significant figure, and yet she disappears from history. All of her male offspring, husbands, grandsons are in the ADB, not her. So I aim to fix that too. <laughs> um, Jenny, we have got lots of questions coming in, but we're um, getting to time. So I just would reflect on the fact that my colleague, Eddie Cabillo, is not here with us today in the room, but he's definitely here in um, spirit and presence. And this um, invitation is a joint one from him and I. And, you know, it's really... Um, Barbara's 1971 paper has is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, it's in, it, it offers, and I would encourage people, I would also say always go back to the documents. There are lessons to be embedded that have not yet been heard that are for future lawyers to think with and take up and to also acknowledge, as you have done, and it's so important, the amount of women who also happen to be lawyers who fought in this space for land justice for a very long time is a really untold and undertold story. So this has been hugely important for all of us here as a community for many, many reasons. And I'm very sorry for those asking questions at home. Um, maybe um, after the actual telecast is <laughs> over, we can um, have a continued conversation. So just would like to all join me in thanking um, Jenny. <laughs>